Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have a brand new guest, Burzeen Wagmar. And uh, before I introduce you to him a little bit, let's first welcome Burzeen. Burzeen, welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar. Namaste. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. So uh, I'm going to read Burzeen's background because I don't want to make a mistake. So please bear with me. Uh, Burzeen Wagmar is a librarian for South Asia and Indo-Iranian languages at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London, where he also holds academic affiliations with the Center for Iranian Studies, Center for the Study of Pakistan, and SOAS, South Asia Institute. He's also a fellow of the European Federation for South Asian Studies. His specialization is in ancient Iranian and Central Asian history and languages. Uh, so, Burzeen, where did it all begin for you? Were you born in the United Kingdom or were you born in uh, some other country, sir? Well, I was born in Bombay, where I spent my public school years, a uh, person to which I secured my bachelor's at the College of William Mary, Virginia, Williamsburg, Virginia, and subsequent to that, my master's in uh, Iranian and Islamic studies at Boston University, after which I have come to SOAS for my doctoral work on uh, the Silk Road and Afghan studies. And of course, um, as you asked, where did it all begin? It's like the further forward you look, the further backward you see. I started with in international relations. And of course, that uh, intrigued me to study about the mi mi medieval and ancient periods, which is what I do now. But of course, um, I keep both hands in the fire. And I'm very happy uh, to comment as I am called upon for also the modern period and the modern Silk Road, as we know, since my work is of specialization on the ancient Silk Road from Xinjiang to what is uh, Iran. That's an excellent introduction, Burzeen. And uh, so I take it that you wanted to find out where your ancestors were, your ancestor land, perhaps. I don't know. I'm just making this up here. But it, it's very impressive that uh, you've uh, pursued something that not many people will probably do. But at the, at the same time, it's very, very intriguing because we would like to have an expert weigh in on the happenings. Let's start with what is happening in Iran. Now, Iran had a fairly high incidence of COVID. And then what I'm hearing now, which is not publicized much, is that the opposition has united to oppose the government on its involvement in the BRI, Border Roads Initiative. Now, what can you tell our uh, viewers about what is going on? How much of an involvement is uh, China's uh, infrastructural uh, you know, investments into Iran? What is going to happen to the port of Chawahar? So I leave it to you uh, to explain to us uh, where, where you see things. Right. Could I, Mr. Raya, begin by pointing this out to your uh, viewers, particularly a South Asian uh, viewership. The Islamic Republic of Iran since 1979 is a functioning theocracy, arguably the only one of its kind in the world as we know it, and a self-styled Islamic Republic. And um, it is a maddeningly intriguing place in that uh, power paralysis and inertia is the order of the day. Uh, the executive, legislature and judiciary, not to mention the other bodies of government, overseeing bodies like the Guardian Council and the Council for Expediency Matters are all fiefdoms who have their own, shall we say in South Asian parlance, satta, and which pre precisely goes to point out the destructive politics of the place. It is a strong state, mind you, it is a strong uh, state with police uh, state apparatus features. By no means is it a liberal state. It is definitely illiberal, despite having elections, which only puts paid the no notion that having elections doesn't qualify one for democracy. In fact, it's the only one of the Middle East states um, in the region since 1979 to have elections, but highly constricted, qualified elections, uh, which are not free or fair in any or every sense of the term. So that should tell you what I'm about to state with uh, President Xi Jinping's 2016 visit to Tehran and what has been put out as the Belt and Road Initiative to the Islamic Republic. And uh, that is going to pan out over some 25 years to the tune of $400 billion worth of projects. Now, these projects include, well, pretty much any and everything, including um, Iran's, first of all, aging infrastructure. 
Uh, and by that, I mean not just the sanctions which have had an acute effect since 2006, that too, but uh, on, the, on its refineries and the possibility of updating these uh, refineries on actually having an LNG terminal because Iran doesn't have any processing facility, which should also point out to you why uh, India declined uh, to join with the Pakistan-Iran pipeline because not just the Pakistan factor of insecurity, of consistent supplies being interrupted if things go awry with Islamabad, that too, but uh, partly to do with Iran's woeful infrastructure uh, that would have left the Indians a questionable and not find it a dependable uh, source in the long run. So Iran's aging infrastructure needs to be cranked up. Um, just to take Iran air as a Throw away example, Mr. Ayer. I mean, uh, if you think Air India uses aging aircrafts, you can uh, be sure Iran Air is woefully uh, behind the times, still using 40 year old Boeing 747s, and which have just gone to storage uh, because, of course, they can't uh, get things on the market, as you can imagine. But uh, that is where China comes in. Iran doesn't have much to do with the outside world in terms of um, business. Obviously, things since 1979 haven't made it. In, amicable partner, both, both politically and eco, so, uh, economically and socially, so to speak. And of course, here comes along another illiberal, utterly unrepresentative regime. And obviously, uh, they make for excellent bedfellows because Iran doesn't question China and vice versa. And it's the former than the, rather than the latter, which is more um, questionable, if not disgraceful, Considering what happens in Xinjiang, which we will come to later, and the way uh, China treats its Muslim minorities so appallingly, yet Iran never loses an opportunity to castigate Israel, in fact, to threaten to wipe it off the face of the map, quote unquote, and also wades into matters on Kashmir as it did after Article 370, if you re realize. Uh, and Khamenei has made uh, comments to the effect, if you remember in 2015, that the, uh, the, the struggle in Kashmir, Bahrain and Yemen is entirely legitimate and it is incumbent upon Muslims everywhere to support them to the hilt for the same. Yet, uh, I mean, considering what has happened in Kashmir and um, Palestine, uh, Xinjiang Muslims would only look on uh, ruefully as to wish that they could have the lives that what Palestinians and Kashmiris enjoy, uh, given how Xinjiang has practically turned into a Nazi style internment camp. But of course, Iran is a tactical about it, if not outright hypocritical. And so, um, you know, it doesn't say anything uh, to China on that. And obviously, China is not in the business of uh, finger wagging and talking about human rights and decency to other states, which works very well in not just Iran's and Pakistan's favor for the CPEC, but of course, a swathe of African countries where they've gone and um, deposited themselves. So what will happen with uh, this so-called deal, which is not, uh, which details have not really come out completely in the open. Mind you, first things first, in the Iranian diaspora, and so many have left since 79 with the brain drain, as you know, and Iranians of all contentions, Mr. Raya, ex-royalists of, still who are empathetic of the Pahlavi regime, Islamists, secular intellectuals, the Iranian left, there always was a Marxist left since the 1940s, a, a motley assortment, uh, of intellectuals, academics, journalists, poets, and writers in the diaspora have all signed a letter just a week and a half ago calling upon the Iranian government to have nothing to do with Beijing and this BRI scheme, which is but a debt trap. And uh, this also points out to the fact that um, Iran is very skittish about its uh, so-called independence. Remember when Khomeini came to power in 79, his motto was, neither east nor west, obviously log at logger's head with the Carter administration and the US as you know, but also he had nothing to do with the Soviet Union, which was a godless communist regime and uh, flew in the face of his Islamic sensibilities, which he uh, maintained. And this is interesting to see because China will seek leverage, which it just will uh, for over Iranian ports, defense installations, intelligence sharing and the like, and just how will that pan out with the IRGC, the Pastoran or the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Rottweilers of the regime, who really do call the shots in more ways than one. 
uh, and it's it's question to be seen how will their independence uh, be compromised and leverage will be sought because iran has been fierce about its uh, so called independence uh, and its foreign policy uh, pursuance since 79 which clearly flies in the face of western values and it has gone along with that despite the hardships it has endured since 1979 simply in the name of maintaining its so called independence uh, now that is to be seen uh the question is um sino iranian naval games uh, naval exercises are occurring in the persian gulf they started around just after 2014 which was a, an, a, a first um, since the islamic regime came to power in 79 and these have become regular features now what will happen as part of the bri deal which has been signed with tehran and which jawad zarif did so when he visited peking is this iran uh, the prc will play an important role at abadan and that mr i do remember until the war the second world war and even into the 50s abadan was the world's largest refinery it was the anglo iranian oil refine aioc corporation which after the 50s became bp uh, british petroleum and it remains the largest refinery in the world which of course the nazis were after and churchill was determined to protect during the war years if you remember too yes. iran is going to have access to abadan what's more uh, iran will also have access just off the persian gulf uh, at the keshm island which is a special duty free economic zone and they will have a beachhead there too the chinese and uh, the, Ch the chinese are talking about upgrading the port of jask which is just a bit further from chabahar which prime minister modi inaugurated uh, in 2016 when he visited tehran may 2016 if you recollect so if you are understanding and getting at what i'm implying iran is and these string of uh, chinese strongholds abadan jask and between abadan and jask uh, mr rayer yes go ahead um i'm sorry you finish your thought and i ask i just wanted to tell you that i have two or three questions on iran and then we'll go to the next topic please finish yeah. your thought yeah. between abadan and jask uh, is the straits of homers through which 19 million barrels of oil daily flows a fifth of the world supply through just two lanes and you can imagine and you do know what a strategic chokehold that has been and we've seen action uh, with the royal navy in recent years there not to mention the 80 to 88 iraq war and the tanker wars if you recollect uh, so china is pretty much going to have a Uh, control over what is the world's global oil supply and uh, leverage with Iran on that as you can imagine and uh, just on the last point i do need to uh, point this out china is also helping uh, 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 iran in um, uh, just as the great firewall project that they have uh, that is to say uh, it will provide infrastructure for a 5g telecommunication network to offer the chinese gps global positioning system baidu there which will help iranian authorities assert even greater control than they already have over its population which is controlled uh, and is a highly censored uh, society with slow internet connections and the like which of course china does very well on its mainland with its with its great firewall uh, program as you know please go ahead yeah so um, my first question is a curious one um the instance of covid attacking uh, not just iranian population but also some members of the cabinet i hear i heard that many of them had just returned from china is that true yes some of them did and uh, uh, visits to uh, beijing are very very frequent and of course uh, there are even uh, direct flights from tehran to shenzhen which is the economic zone just north of hong kong uh, commercial ties have been very strong in the last uh, decade particularly the last decade and uh, uh, there's a lot of toing and froing and jawad zarif has been making more than one official visits uh, to uh, ink of this deal but the question is now it will come into parliament and there is something to be said about the iranian parliament in as much as it's an illiberal regime which it is it is a very fractious noisy parliament they do have circumspect oversight and of course uh, cynical politics and horse trading takes place as it does take place in south asia too and they will try to discredit rouhani uh, the regime the hardliners would uh, particularly uh, uh, the ex regime of amri najad if you recollect and the irgc who are at logger loggers head with rouhani
And plus, like I said, there are so many factions within factions, including the last guy, Ali Larijani, who was the Speaker of the Assembly and part of the uh, nuclear deal at, at one point. Uh, he is, of course, out of favor too, but he's also part of the hardline clique. And Kamenei has a difficult time uh, juggling uh, all of them as the supreme leader. Please note, he's known as the Rahbar or the supreme guide, which is like a quasi uh, theocratic, uh, juridical, political post uh, akin to a Shia philosopher imam. He stands about uh, uh, Rouhani, who's the president. But remember that Rouhani is a rubber stamp president just like the Indian president who has to assent to what the Supreme Leader says. So even the nuclear deal, which was a complete one-off and that they, they had to show a saving face that they were signing something with Iran, it had to go through uh, Khamenei. Otherwise, it wouldn't have uh, gone through. That's the same. Thank you. Now, um, with the opposition uniting to oppose uh, the government on BRI, would that mean that uh, the Chabahar port perhaps would again start coming towards India's uh, direction. Because one of the things that people have told me is that even though India signed the deal in 2016 uh, on Chabahar, that the Iranians were not really keen that India come in and work on their infrastructure. It was almost always like, we'll do it, we'll do it, like a delay tactic. Something that was good for optics. India got some cheap crude, and in exchange, Iran got uh, food and other infrastructural help from India. And now even that is stopped because uh, the U.S. Uh, went back on its uh, Iran accord. So my question to you, sir, is do you think there might be a rethink on part of the Iranian government vis-a-vis -vis Chabahar and India? At the time of speaking just now, it's difficult to tell because of the erraticness of the regime. Now, what would have gone into the Chabahar thinking is this. Uh, India and Iran have enjoyed a good strategic relationship since '79. There have been ups and downs, most recently with India going in the General Assembly and supporting the sanctions against Iran, uh, which, of course, didn't go down well with Tehran, but they were politic and diplomatic enough to realize where India was coming from. And that has not disrupted India's trade because India is the second largest supplier after China for Iranian oil, much to Washington's annoyance, as you know, who has asked New Delhi to completely turn off the tap and depend on Riyadh for the same. And also, uh, Mr. I may, I may point out, this is unconfirmed, I repeat, unconfirmed, but it has been put out with Indian visits around the mid-2000s that there has been some defense agreement signed with New Delhi and the MOD, uh, but the details of which are not exactly known. But we do know this. Uh, much to the U.S.'s annoyance, India has still held its own in that uh, Iranian submarines, uh, Soviet, uh, Russian supplied submarines, were refitted at Mazgon Docks, Bombay, uh, because they were tropicalized for the battery and to in, uh, extend the uh, lease of the long life. Because Mazgon Docks, of course, is pretty much goes back to Soviet Indo-Soviet cooperation days, as you know. And uh, the uh, the Indians have uh, refitted and extended the lifeline of two or three Iranian submarines, which, of course. Uh, a surprise Washington came to know just on the heels of Bush's visit, if you remember, Bush uh, Jr. Uh, so there has been some defense, uh, considerable but quiet defense uh, agreement. It's not just been an oil-centric relationship with New Delhi. Where, where Chabahar comes in, of course, is with the Western Afghanistan bit. Please remember that Western Afghanistan was part of the Persian Empire, the Safavid Empire, Herat and the environs around. And of course, Iran has always looked upon Western Afghanistan as Iran irredenta in one sense. And it was and the Chabar lifeline was that India's supplies would go into Western Afghanistan through Farah and Herat province uh, with uh, supplies of wheat, food and the like, food grains and the like, uh, which was happening after Modi inaugurated the port. But of course, remember that from Chabar, and where is Chabar, Mr. Ayer, is the question. It is in Iranian Baluchistan, the namesake province in the Islamic Republic, just as next door Pakistan. But just as next door Pakistan, it is Iran's largest and most impoverished province, and a restive one at that, because you are dealing with a Sunni minority who chafes under Shia theocratic rule and has felt the blunt hand of a Shia regime from Tehran uh, in its uh, policies and bigotry. So partly, of course, Iran is dealing with a very restive province. 
So there was the element of having uh, foreigners there, even if they were okay as Indian foreigners. And of course, uh, it has to juggle its act with Pakistan next door, who is seething with the fact that there are Indian engineers and technicians uh, on the rail and road line uh, for the Khorasan Highway going into Western Afghanistan. And of course, these are genuine engineers and the like. They're not Indian intelligence spooks. But a, a paranoid Pakistan would have none of it and would have also put some pressure on um, Tehran for the same because Iran has to juggle its uh, relationship with both. And it has so far managed to pull off a politic, uh, one, a sort of blow hot blow cold with both Tehran, with Islamabad and New Delhi. Thank you very much for that clarification. And let's move on to the next topic, which is that of uh, Gilgit Baltistan. So as far as our viewers are concerned, uh, Burzeen, I want to just kind of give you, we have touched upon this uh, topic a few times. I've had many experts weigh in. So from what I have researched and written, there was a colony of Chinese engineers, technicians, population, if you will, there was an enclave formed in Gilgit, and this is completely walled off. Inside that, there were all Chinese signs. There are videos that show that thing. It kind of goes to prove that China has either, quote unquote, acquired the rights to do all this, or there is something beyond what you see on uh, that, that meets the normal eye. So what is your perception of what is happening in Gilgit, Pakistan? Because we had one of their members come and speak on uh, in the United General uh, United Nations General Assembly also about uh, the oppression that the Pakistani government is putting on them. So, what is your take on Gil Gilgit Baltistan? Right. Um, instead of the year and now, which you've asked for, I need to uh, foreground the situation. The Chinese have not recently arrived here, Ms. Raya. They have been there to be precise from 1966. And why do I say that? That is when. Ayub Khan decided with Mao to construct what became the Sinopak Highway or the Karakoram Highway, which construction started in 66 until 78. And much water flowed under the bridge, as you can imagine, by which time Zia was in power when it was inaugurated in 78. It was open for official trade and travel in 82 and to the world at large, including alpine climbers, um, tourists, travelers, and regular Pakistanis who now shuttle up and down to Xinjiang for business from May 86 onwards. In all effects, it's still a white elephant. Pakistan loves to tout it, no doubt. It is the world's largest, highest, uh, world's highest international metalled highway crossing, true. But maintenance uh, comes at a cost. It is closed from October to uh, May because of the winter factor. And tra trade and travel, no doubt, has occurred over the years. But it has not made the impact of what Pakistan would have us believe. It remains at best underutilized and will continue to be so, despite what is touted as Kashka from Xinjiang to uh, Gilgit and from Gilgit all the way down to the Raven Sea and Karachi port. Uh, in principle, it is uh, that. That is true. But um, it's not really what meets the eye. So the Chinese have been there since then. Do not forget that in March 63, coming on the heels of the Sino-Indian War, a very pragmatic politic Zulfikar Ali Bhutto as foreign minister in Ayub's cabinet decided to quell the Chinese, assuage the Chinese, and uh, settle a border dispute. Because remember, Mao's China had border disputes with everyone post-communism after October 1st, 1949, with about 12 different states in the region. Afghanistan, the Soviets, India, and uh, Pakistan too. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto caught the bus, he wouldn't miss it, signed off a, a sino pak border agreement by which Pakistan divested 2,050 square kilometers to the PRC. But this question, this bit in the land in question, which has been parceled out that I refer to, is the trans karakoram tract that was, in a sense, part of the erstwhile Jammu and Ka Kashmir kingdom under British India. The Shaksgam Valley, that is to say, and the grazing pastures which were given off to um, the from Gilgit Baltistan to the PRC. And the question is, the very fact that Pakistan went and did this uh, must demonstrate its um, 
intentions, bad faith to say the least on the entire Kashmir question about which it seems to shriek horse every so now and often and has been doing so since 47. What is your sincerity when there is an ongoing dispute that you parcel out a bit for ter territory to a third party who doesn't have anything to say on hand? But that is what happened. So the PRC has been in Gilgit Baltistan since the 60s. That I hope I've established now. What has happened with the CPEC is, well, where does the CPEC start from? Naturally, Gilgit Baltistan and ends in Balochistan from north to south of Pakistan, as you can envisage on a map. And about at least a good um, two, I, I'm given to understand at least a good um, 200 deals, mineral deals have been signed off with from Gilgit Baltistan, uh, Islamabad to say the federal capital, to speaking on uh, mining rights in Gilgit Baldistan, including for gold and molybdenum, which is used for space technology, because it's a rich uh, mineral rich region. But again, here's the catch, and which exposes Pakistan's uh, sincerity, if not hollowness on the entire Kashmir question. Gilgit Baldistan, as a de facto de jure province, is not part of the Pakistani Federation. It would be, if all, for all purposes and intents, Pakistan's fifth province, but it has been in administrative limbo since 47. A Gilgit Baltistan Ordinance Act was passed in 2009. There is a cosmetic unicameral local assembly, but which uh, does precious little since the call, shots are called from Islamabad. And the locals themselves have been clamoring for greater self-representation in Islamabad at the federal level, which has never come to pass. Because Pakistan's contention is the, the moment it would accept Gilgit Baltistan as a fifth province, wouldn't that be accepting a fait accompli on the Kashmir question and that the LOC becomes a complete border and it's like JNK is with India and Azad Kashmir and GB are with Pakistan. So it has shied away from the question and in so doing, it has compromised on the aspirations of the Gilgit Baltistani indigenous people. <coughs> so that has happened. But then the question is, um, what else? So Pakistan uh, doesn't think twice about divesting mining rights and other rights to Chinese companies and uh, p uh, public sector firms on um, Gilgit Baltistan without consulting the local population, without taking them on board about the entire question of Gilgit Baltistan's uh, aspirations. And just as with Balochistan and other provinces, there is precious little to show in terms of trickle-down economics and what would actually be beneficial much as the CPEC is touted as um, the greatest thing to happen to Pakistan since 1947. I mean, in one sense, in a profound sense, Mr. Ayer, uh, one wishes Pakistan well, because if it were to settle down and progress, things would definitely cool down in the region. So one would very desperately wish to hope. But what of it with this so-called, now what stands as, as an, 87 billion dollar agreement and pakistanis thinking pakistanis themselves have queried aloud as to what the government has gone and signed off since nawaz sharif inked it in 2013 when it stood at 46 billion the entire deal constitutes six percent of pakistan's gdp and the question of debt servicing and reservicing rather as what as was pointed out in a first study made by Deloitte in 2013, is eye-watering to say the least. But to come back to Gilgit Baltistan, and I do hope I've uh, covered the points that you wanted uh, on uh, the Chinese. And yes, the Chinese are very much in the province. The uh, one part of the Karakor, uh, one part of the first phase of the CPEC agreement was resurfacing and maintenance of the Karakoram Highway. As you can imagine, it requires in that part of the world. And indeed, that has uh, occurred by strengthening the arteries, uh, the, the road artery. So the Chinese have very much been there. Plus, Chinese security forces and People's Liberation Army is very much in uh, not just Gilgit Baltistan, but also the Wakhan Corridor in Afghanistan, as we do know now, despite it being officially denied. So um, one, one question on a follow up on Gilgit Baltistan. According to you, uh, which areas of Aksai Chin and Gilgit Baltistan constitute what used to be called Gostana, which means the, the land of go cows? Gostana? So, yeah. uh, 
Well, I read Cotonese, and Galstana is in Sanskrit, but also the Cotonese language, which is a Middle Iranian language. It's the easternmost Iranian language which was spoken in late antiquity on the Silk Road, and the Kingdom of Khotan, which is on the Silk Road in the Tarim Basin as one of the states. Gaustana Desha, uh, which was known as in, in, in Cotonese literature, is that part which applies not to Aksai Chin or to even Kashka, but to Khotan. And Khotan, as we know, is famous from uh, the middle, medieval period uh, and the Silk Road period for jade because uh, that was the supply of jade to the Tang dynasty, the Tang emperors in Chang'an and what is today's uh, present day Xi'an. And there was, uh, the legend has it, uh, Mr. Ayer, as you know, and uh, all legends made for good tales, that Ashoka's son Kunal had founded the kingdom of Khotan. Uh, but uh, that is not really ca the case. What is the case that it was a colony, it was a kingdom of uh, Indo-Iranian speakers. And when Sir Arul Stein uh, undertook Chinese uh, Central Asian excavations in the 1900s, the first uh, two decades of the 20th century, we found a cache of documents, not to mention artifacts, so many of which are at the National Museum in New Delhi, but also at the British Museum in London and also uh, elsewhere. And we have uh, Sanskrit manuscripts, but also Cotonese manuscripts, including, I might point out, a version of the Ramayan in Cotonese, uh, among other Buddhist sutra texts. So Thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, in a in a, a future uh, conversation, we're going to talk about a little bit about the relationship of Sanskrit or its derivatives, even Prakrit before that, and and all that stuff in the Central Asian region. We'll do that separately because. That could have a fascinating. Yes. Uh, we, we all of us are rediscovering our past. It's a yeah. good thing that we all want to know where we all started from. Because yeah. I don't know how much you know about this Burzine, but uh, Kaikei is supposed to be from where modern-day Iran is. Uh, that Dasharatha's third wife, and and therefore, I mean, you you go back and look at the names of all these things. You know, they all have Indian equivalent names. So it will we'll have a, a fascinating discussion on that. No. And just to leave you on that, there is such, such a thing called, well, we call what is Vedic Sanskrit and classical Sanskrit, as we know in the Indian mainland, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. there is something called Central Asian Sanskrit, which is a very particular form of Sanskrit and Prakrit, uh, which was found in, uh, shall we say, documents or chalans, literally chalans, and you find them um, written on wooden tablets, so and so receipt page to so and so, and it gives you a peep into life a thousand years ago or in the Tarim Basin and the Khotan states. These are Prakrit documents. And uh, like I said, they are very much uh, there to be seen at the National Museum in New Delhi. That's wonderful to know, sir. And uh, now, um, viewers, we are about halfway into our discussion, and we have two more topics to go. And I request you that we will not take questions for this particular uh, hangout because Burzin needs to cover a fair amount of ground still. But we will continue to, we'll start taking questions from you from the next episode. We are going to be having him back in a couple of weeks time. There's so much to cover. He's a, he's a, a library and encyclopedia of knowledge. And I'm, I'm very, very uh, delighted to have you with us, Burzin. And uh, so your viewers, uh, please excuse us for not taking your questions for this particular episode. However, what we will do is we'll take down your questions and we'll be sure to ask them in our next hangout. So, Burzin, let's take a look at what is happening in Kashmir. Farooq Abdullah gives an interview <clears throat> to the grand old man of Indian journalism, Karan Thapar, and he says that now his uh, loyalties are with the Chinese or something to that effect. What is he blabbering about? And is it blabber or is it an intelligent uh, hint to tell India that, okay, Pakistan has abandoned us, but we are Chinese brothers now. So what is your take on that? Well, first things first, I think Mr. Thapar is a sprightly young man, so he's not quite Dada Boy Nauroji and the grand old man of Indian journalism. I'm sure he will grow from strength to strength and still stay very much uh, with us. Um, uh, but he's a senior journalist, no doubt, and you're quite right to point that out. Um, in a word, Ms. Raya, repeat, in a word, uh, Dr. Abdullah's remarks were injudicious. And I'll tell you why. Uh, to think, and again, I like to harken back as a historian, this is the very same Dr. Abdullah who threw a fit when um, Mr. Dulat came to him just before Christmas 1999 to secure release of the, uh, the terrorists 
for the Kandahar Indian Airlines uh, hijacking that took place. Dr. Abdullah went against the grain of what was the government's thinking in New Delhi with Prime Minister Vajpay. And uh, as we know, he threw a right royal fit that one doesn't compromise with terrorists. And it is entirely admirable and laudable to point that out. And to think that this was the very man who went against the BJP back then, which was, shall we say, sounding almost wobbly and uh, liberal uh, to yield to um, a bunch of a clutch of terrorists in Taliban held Afghanistan back then. And for him now to, um, I mean, do a volta face and make a remark to the effect that today, chief Kashmir is chief under the so-called Indian yoke and would in a, a moment's note, at a moment's notice, prefer Peking's rule over New Delhi's. Well, how do you um, gather up and, uh, posit uh, and situate those remarks against the current context? Um, Perhaps it's Dr. Abdullah's isolation, which may have led him to have an outburst and therefore make such an injudicious remark. But it's also patently uncharitable that an otherwise thinking Muslim statesman and one who has had very long political innings as he does, to have made such a remark without realizing what is going on in Xinjiang. And what is exactly going on in Xinjiang, uh, Mr. Raya? Well, for one thing, Chinese mosques or I shouldn't say Chinese, but Uyghur mosques and Mosulia, the Dargahs, have been raised, including those which harken back to about 100 to 150 year old uh, uh, Sufi shrines. Halal signs are prohibited at uh, eating establishments across Urumqi, the provincial capital, and Kashgar, among other parts, including what is Khotan today. Uh, Uyghur varsity students are forbidden from fasting during the holiest month of the Islamic calendar, namely Ramadan. What's more, they are made to sit at lunchtime and eat with their Chinese uh, compatriots and professors. Imagine if this were to happen at Srinagar University, where a right-wing Hindu uh, mob were to demand Kashmiri Muslim students come and forcibly have a meal with them and break their fast. I leave that for you to uh, and your viewers to decide. And to think that Dr. Abdullah could remark that. And it gets worse, Mr. Raya. The Chinese authorities are forcibly feeding pork in these internment camps to Uyghur detainees. And these camps consist of families who are completely dislocated and broken up. There are men in these camps, and at times there are women and children in these camps. Uh, and they're not together as families, but separated out at so many other sites, as recently the Australians have pointed out here in a recent uh, policy paper, an Australian think tank, that is to say. And Uyghur women staying at homes in Xinjiang and Khotan, as we talked about, and elsewhere, are, well, the men are not there because they've been uh, bundled off into internment. There are Chinese men who are domiciled in their homes, and obviously they have pretty much concubinage rights over them. One heard a lot of uncharitable, malicious, irresponsible nonsense after Article 370 was revoked that Indian men are going to have a jolly good time in Kashmir with Kashmiri women. Well, a calendar year has passed and I've seen none of that in terms of atrocities coming to pass. But that is precisely what is happening in Xinjiang. To point so out is neither sensationalist nor sinophobic. It has been repeatedly pointed out by Uyghur dissidents, by those who have escaped, and by human rights uh, organizations who have had some access. And in, uh, it must be pointed out that the Chinese are brazen enough to allow sometimes people access to these camps and then tout them to be re-education centers. But re-education for what? to grind someone's personality down to the bare minimum and to build him up again as a Han Sinitic Chinese citizen by destroying his very Muslimness, as they call it. Well, that again brings the question to, uh, to mind. What do you mean by Muslimness? Uh, the Uyghurs have been Muslims for a thousand years, uh, plus years now, and they have been domiciled in Xinjiang, historically speaking. Granted, there have been terrorist incidents in Xinjiang, and these have had to do with uh, questions of economics, autonomy, identity, and a very heavy-handed uh, Chinese presence since 1949. But um, it is one thing to talk about terrorists or particularly discuss terrorists, where, say, which is done, say, in India, Israel, Britain, or elsewhere. 
but to take an entire population, designate them as terrorists wholesale, and then to treat them to such um, Nazi-style internment conditions is reprehensible to say the least. I mean, in England, we had what were the troubles in the 70s with the Irish question, as you know, but the entire Catholic population was not deemed as terrorists, Mr. Raya. This is what the Chinese are doing in Xinjiang. India doesn't do that in uh, with the Kashmir issue that it's had, where all Indian Muslims are tar brushed with Kashmiris, surely. Did Dr. Abdullah not pause for a moment to cogitate on that before actually having such an outburst that uh, in uh, Srinagar's Muslims would, and Jammu's Muslims would prefer to live under a, an administration which forcibly feeds folk, removes men folk from their homes, uh, sets up a system of concubinage, and uh, destroys uh, dargahs and mosques, prohibits prayer, and also what are conspicuous uh, Muslim appearances of prayer caps, uh, beards, and the like. What is he exactly on about? And not for a moment did Mr. Thapa care to pause and qualify his remarks on that, but simply let him proceed on. Perhaps he did because uh, uh, perhaps after internment, it was only fair to let Dr. Abdullah have his say. I grant that, but yet uh, it was irresponsible of Mr. Thapa and Wire and Mr. Vadarajan at large to have permitted this uh, unchallenged. Well, um... Wire has been known to take a very left uh, line on, on matters, and uh, that's that's what you're going to expect from them. But uh, let's move on to, I think you already referred to this a little bit, the unrest in Xinjiang. Now, from what viewers know up until now, their hospitals are among the best in the world for organ transfer, uh, organ harvesting, I mean. And um, one of our guests said that... Uh, the rich uh, uh, receivers from the Middle East prefer to have Xinjiang body parts because they believe that these people are also Muslims and that they do not eat pork. Now, if so, I'm seeing a couple of uh, you know contrarian things here. If Chinese force feed them with pork, would that not diminish their market value? Because essentially, one school of thought is that the Uyghurs are being uh, you know, imprisoned for their organs. So uh, I'm, can you read this a little bit more? What is happening? Because it's not just the Uyghurs. Uh, I also know that Falun Gong, which is Buddhist in character, they are also much coveted. And the reason for that is that they tend to be vegetarians for the most part. They don't eat, uh, they don't eat meat and they also don't drink, which means that they have a, what you call as a healthy constitution. So perhaps you can... Uh, throw some light on all these things that's happening there. Uh, Mr. Rad, I, I must yield to you on this one. I do know about organ harvesting, which is taking place with the Falun Gong. I have heard about it occurring with the Uyghurs, but I did not know, as you're pointing out, that there is a flourishing trade racket for these said organs being taken uh, for Middle Eastern donors. That, I must confess, is news to me. So thank you for pointing that bit out. But I do know that organ harvesting is taking place, not to mention a Uyghur slave a prison camp labor that is being used in supply chains uh, for Nike and also for H&M, among other uh, famous uh, high street brands. In fact, H&M in, in England, and you do have that state side too, have un yielded under pressure and have decided to investigate their supply chains and have revoked some of these contracts with the Chinese. Uh, with Nike, of course, I don't know what's happened, but the pressure should be on and quite rightly so. But of course, if this is happening, because I brought in the pork bit, as I've told you, which I do know for a fact, and which Chinese reporters have also mentioned and there was a very important article in the Daily Telegraph on that, a British newspaper, which was eye revealing, if not shocking. And um, but again, to linger on the pork, because I do believe it's an important point to make the stunning hypocrisy of the Muslim world at large. Pakistan's Imran Khan went on record to state, I believe, to Al Jazeera that he doesn't quote think much about the Uyghurs. That is to say, not he's inconsiderate about it, but even worse, he doesn't have time to actually cogitate or reflect upon them, which uh, tells you something again about Pakistan's sincerity on Islamic matters, not to mention Kashmir, but then of course how they treat their own um, kin 
Kithin Kin in Gilgit Baltistan, not to mention Balochistan, who are fellow Sunnis in Balochistan, but of course Shia in Gilgit Baltistan. And I believe you did make a mention to the Shia in Gilgit Baltistan as a predominant population. Well, that is true in the Gilgit region, but in the Hunza region, we have what are the Aga Khan Ismailis who reside there, who have not quite faced the full brunt with Shia Sunni sectarian politics as, as it has happened in Gilgit, which precisely Zia ul Haq released are uh, unleashed in the 80s. And he did so, and this is again a uh, pathetically ironical Misraya, by bringing in Sunni Pashtuns from Chitral next door and the NWFP province to settle and domicile in Gilgit Baltistan and alter the demographics. And this is a very Pakistan who talks about Hindus flooding the Kashmir Valley and altering the demographics of uh, Jammu and Kashmir when nothing of the sort has taken place, even a year on after Article 370. But this has taken place and there have been periodic massive unrest in Gilgit, which has been harshly quelled by the Pakistan army and which Zia went out of his way to stoke from the late 80s onwards. Um, viewers, uh, we are going to have uh, a few excerpts of speeches from different personalities who used to belong to Pakistan, who have actually opened their hearts out at the UN General Assembly. That's going to be part of another episode that we are going to be doing with another speaker. I just wanted to mention that to you. But uh, Burzeen, um, as far as uh, Gilgit Baltistan is concerned, I mean, um, they, Pakistan is doing what they have done to the Pak occupied Kashmir because now I believe there is not a single Kashmiri speaking family in POK. It's mostly Punjabi speaking families. But so, they always have been, Mr. Raya, for the simple reason that the dialects, the Pahari and the Gojri uh, dialects and uh, Hindko that is spoken in uh, what is uh, Pakistan's Azad Kashmir part, the sliver, which after the ceasefire of 48 became part of Pakistan and has remained so. The, the question has been a stalemate, as you know. There, the region, those speakers are not strict to sense of Kashmiris because they don't speak Kashmiri, which is a Dardic language. They speak Punjabi dialects, Northern Hill dialects, not even what is standard Punjabi Lahanda register. Mirpuri uh, and Gojri and Pahari are North Punjabi Hill dialects, uh, which are spoken there and have always been spoken even when Hari Singh ran the kingdom up to 1947, when they were his subjects. Uh, and there was talk in the 30s, if you must know. But it never came to pass, and I wish it had, because that would have uh, quelled the dissatisfaction which even exists today in Azad Kashmir, to take these hill districts and fuse them into the province of Punjab. That is what was British India's Punjab, and subsequently became West and East Punjab. Uh, but it never came to pass, and it should have been done, because that would clearly reflect uh, the aspirations and sentiments, because the inhabitants even there of Azad Kashmir do not feel uh, Kashmiri at all. And those in the valley have always looked askance at them as not exactly Kashmiri. I mean, you can share a bond of religion at best, but even ethno-linguistically, socially, culturally, their worldviews have been utterly distinct, which tells something about the diversity of the Jammu Kashmir kingdom, which uh, Hari Singh um, signed over to India in October 47. It wasn't a monolith place. By no means it was an entirely Muslim place. And that's important to point out that there are Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists who reside even now in what is Jammu, Kashmir, Ladakh on this side, and of course, what is Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan on that side. Can you share some percentages of non Muslims in uh, Pak occupied Kashmir? Uh, well, I think it's practically nil because uh, it was an effective. Uh, dislocation of all Hindus who left from what were the districts around um, Kotli and Mirpur town and the rest um, who came over to the Indian side uh, after the, uh, the war, which protracted from October 47 to the uh, ceasefire in January 48. Uh, there were Hindus and Sikhs traders who lived, resided there during British India days, but they all came over. So it's pretty much an entirely, I dare say, a homogenous Muslim uh, Sunni population in what is Azad Kashmir today. There are no none left at all, so to speak, which, of course, um, is clearly the case with partition fault lines that uh, one still had appreciable Muslim segments of population remaining on the Indian mainland 
but a, uh, uh, the move, the influx of non-Muslims uh, leaving what became the dominion of Pakistan, East and West Pakistan, was greater in number and percentage when one saw the population dip and coming to India. Not just in 47, but also through the 50s and 60s, every now and so and often when massive riots did, did take place, particularly in East Pakistan. Uh, when they, uh, there were massive Hindu influxes uh, occurring right up to just before 71, and when, when it all unraveled, of course. So I'm going to ask you a hypothetical, and uh, I've been talking about this on many television channels. And the question is like this. There are unfilled seats in the Indian parliament for uh, the Pak-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan. Let us say that it is possible to have them elect a representative. It is possible because in, in this day and age, there is some technology like uh, blockchain where you can uniquely register anybody's vote and they can do it from uh, the comfort of their home using a smartphone. They just have to go to a website and then they can cast their vote. So assuming that uh, India takes, because India is not going to just march across and occupy what it considers its own territory because it is also looking at what do I gain other than the fact that I'm getting back what used to be mine because if if there is uh, uh, you know uh, if the population is not welcoming we don't know so the good litmus test for India would be in my opinion that you know they say okay there are unfilled representative seats for you here you can you can elect who you think should be representing your interest in India. And that's the first step before, you know, more formal relations can be established. If this were to be announced, these days you don't need to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, pieces of paper that has to be airdropped for messaging. You can do it on social media. If something like that were to happen, what do you think the reaction would be of the people there? Well, as you put it, these are just hypotheticals, but... Um... And as you rightly pointed out, what's the point of India crossing over to take over a territory where the people and their mindset is dead set against India? And that is clearly in the case of Azad Kashmir. Uh, it is, um, they are pro-Pakistan for all purposes and intents. And might I also point out, Azad Kashmir is um, not exactly the most fertile part of uh, Pakistan. The soil is poor. It's not a uh, fecund uh, as it's in the valley where an array of crops and produce grows. Azad Kashmir's economy is largely and has been timber and for the furniture market uh, for the rest of urban Pakistan. And of course, remittances from Mirpuris who have settled in England uh, 60, 1960s onwards. It has been an under, uh, impoverished region and still remains uh, for the most part because there is the soil is so poor, practically nothing grows there. And that also explains, Mr. Raya, <clears throat> why so many Mirpuris were in the British India Army. Uh, there was nothing to do except set out into the wide world and make a living for oneself. And so they were recruited as Muslim recruitment was very strong in, in, during British India Army days, as you know. And that was part of the problem because these were the ones who led the Poonch Rebellion in 47, which broke out just before the actual tribal invasion that took place too, with, uh, with disgruntled sharecroppers who were actually, Mr. Raya, ex-World War II vets who had just been demobbed and returned back to their villages. Remember, this was 45, 46, as soldiers were returning back home. So it was a volatile situation and everything just spiraled out of control. But it was these guys in the Punch Jagir who first, uh, that was the flashpoint for what actually unraveled for Hari Singh's kingdom. So, <clears throat> Azad Kashmir would have been, and in is all purposes, uh, Pakistan-centric and oriented, I wouldn't even waste an electronic ballot on it. When we come to Gilgit Baltistan, that's another matter. Uh, <clears throat> there is a segment of the population which is ambivalent about Pakistan, admittedly, both the Shia and the Ismaili population. Uh, and perhaps they would vote and see, uh, throw in their lot with a democratic India for a better deal. But having said that, uh, one must be cognizant of the fact that there are stakeholders too who have uh, benefit, benefited from the Pakistan project and who have become, after seven decades, socialized in the Pakistani way of doing things. Uh, Gilgit Baltistanis who do feel Pakistan, Pakistani. 
which of course naturally stands to reason after you know uh, being exposed to Pakistan for seven decades. So with Gilgit Baltistan, it's um, it's the question remains divided. The jury is out there, but with Azad Kashmir, um, I would not even waste an electronic ballot. It's not happening, uh, and they remain some of the most ardent um, uh, nationalists. And also a region where so many terror training camps have take uh, have been set up, and not just for establishing operations against Jammu and Kashmir, but also jihadist operations where you've had Arab Uzbek guerrilla fighters, uh, not just the usual LET or Jaish sorts um, hobnobbing around these uh, campsites. There have been others uh, as part of this uh, tutorial program that the ISI conducts and the deep state conducts across camps dotted across Azad Kashmir. Um, you have given us a very uh, intriguing perspective about uh, these uh, areas. And uh, I think uh, this is going to be a fascinating fortnightly conversation that we are planning to have with you, Ruzin. And thank you very much. We hope to have you back soon. And uh, viewers, we will uh, uh, address your questions in our next Hangout. We'll have a separate time slot for the question and answer session also. Ruzin, thank you very much. And we'll be back soon. Thank you very much, Mr. Rai. Goodbye.